Welcome! Within my World War II series, I'm right at the start of Operation Barbarossa, the invasion of the Soviet Union, but I thought it was time to take a look at the most famous German military formation, the Panzer Division. In three videos, I will briefly explain how these units were formed and how they changed over time in their composition and otherwise. Let's get started! Even before Hitler gained power, the Reichswehr had been planning the creation of small panzer companies. The first crews were trained in the Soviet Union in the early 1930s, then in November 1933 a motor training command was established at Sossen, just outside Berlin. In October 1935 the first three panzer divisions were created, using former cavalry units, right after Hitler announced that Germany was rearming. The next year, all panzer units were mobilized as a central reserve during the occupation of the Rhineland, then more than 100 tanks were sent to Spain to help Franco's forces in the civil war. These Panzerkampfwagen Mark I's were lightly armored and lacked a main gun, so the conclusion was that more training, more experience and better vehicles were needed for better combat results. In 1937, more regiments were formed and large-scale exercises were held, but more experience was gained during the Anschluss in March 1938, when General Major Heinz Guderian led 2nd Panzer Division into Austria. They advanced 700 kilometers in just two days, but lost 30% of their tanks due to technical issues. When Czechoslovakia was dismantled the next year, the possibility of a new war emerged, and Germany was not ready for that. Luckily, the seizure of Czech equipment made it possible to form two more panzer divisions with Škoda tanks, so the situation improved. More reorganization followed in the upper echelons, the first armored corps were created to better lead all available panzer and motorized infantry divisions and to avoid using them in a piecemeal fashion. However, panzer and infantry units were still mixed, the concept of Blitzkrieg was not yet completely ready. Right from the start, movement warfare was preferred, firepower was less important. A key point, Schwerpunkt, had to be selected, the enemy line had to be penetrated with proper concentration of available forces, which then made it possible to outflank, encircle and destroy the opposing forces. Flexibility was also emphasized, plans had to be changed according to the actual situation. An objective was set, but commanders also had the freedom of choice on how to achieve it. The Luftwaffe would provide air support after gaining air superiority, the perfect weapon was almost ready. By August 1939, six panzer divisions were active along with smaller units, but they were still subordinated to different field armies with different objectives. Once Poland fell, all of them were redeployed to the west in October, then four more divisions were created by February 1940, with a complete reorganization, subordinating the entire Panzertruppen to General Major Wilhelm von Thoma, who reported directly to the army staff. For the invasion of the Benelux countries and France, a better concentration of Panzer forces was planned. Army Group B would attack Holland and Belgium with three Panzer divisions, while Army Group A would advance in the middle through the Ardennes to the Meuse with seven panzer and three motorized divisions. These were gathered in army corps, which sometimes bore the name of their commander. 15th Army Corps was named Gruppe Hoth, while 19th Army Corps was called Gruppe Guterian. This level of concentration was kept for the second part of the French campaign, which lasted a mere 20 days and ended in a French surrender. The structure of the Panzer divisions changed a lot during these years, not to mention that lack of equipment prevented uniformity. In September 1939, a Panzer division was supposed to have two Panzer and two motorized infantry, or Schützen regiments, each with two battalions. There was also a motorcycle, reconnaissance, artillery, anti-tank, engineer and communications unit, along with divisional services. However, in early 1940, some divisions had more motorized infantry or they lacked a motorcycle unit, 
or they had only one panzer regiment instead of two, so the picture was quite mixed. Total strength varied between 10 and 14,000 men, with around 400 panzers, 60 armored cars, and 3,000 other vehicles, 1,100 rifles, 400 SMGs, and 5 to 600 light machine guns. They also had 24 field guns or howitzers, 36 light anti-tank guns, and 12 light anti-aircraft guns. Many units were incomplete, there were never enough Panzer Mark III's and Mark IV's, so Panzer Mark I's and Mark II's had to be used in most companies, along with the newly available Czech tanks. The Polish campaign also highlighted the fact that the Panzer divisions needed more infantry and heavy artillery, along with more half-tracks. We should also mention the pioneer units that included both sappers and assault engineers, along with bridging columns. A lack of trained engineers and equipment remained a problem, but by May 1940, all divisions had their three companies, one of which was now fully armored, with SDKFZ 251s. The support units, that comprised 15% of total manpower, were responsible for radio and cable communications, provisions through their butchery and bakery companies, and fuel supplies. Its total payload was 180 tons of supplies and 75 cubic meters of fuel. Proper tactics included careful planning, as the Panzer divisions were restricted to available roads. Only these made a quick advance possible. Advance units consisted of two Panzer battalions. They looked for possible targets. They were followed by the rest of the armor and the motorized infantry, while the reconnaissance battalion was deployed on the flanks to discover any enemy presence. When major rivers had to be crossed, the tanks were moved to the rear, as the proper crossing point had to be found, while villages could be outflanked and left for the Schutzen Brigade to clear, although this caused significant delays already in the second part of the French campaign, once the French turned villages into strong points. Panzer divisions would attack in waves in a narrow sector, which was less than one kilometer. Tanks would lead the charge, but they could rely on infantry, artillery, and engineer support. However, cooperation between these units was not ideal, there was plenty of room for improvement. As I mentioned before, most tanks were old and outdated Panzer Mark I's and Mark II's that lacked a main gun, they were only equipped with machine guns. At the start of the war, there were only 160 Panzer Mark III's, these had a 37mm main gun, while another 211 heavy Panzer Mark IVs were available with their short 75mm gun, which was more suited for infantry support. In contrast, there were 2,700 Panzer Mark I's and Mark II's, although 280 Škoda tanks were also added after the occupation of Czechoslovakia. They also had a 37mm main gun, they were quick and adequately protected, at least by 1939 standards. Interestingly, only around 60% of available tanks were in the Panzer divisions, the rest were distributed among light divisions, training units, and non-divisional formations. In the Polish campaign, 230 tanks were lost, this comprised 9% of the entire Panzer force. Tank production was then increased, more emphasis was placed on the heavier types. The Denmark and Norway campaign ended with minor losses, so by May 1940, there were 2,500 tanks in the Panzer divisions, with another 1,000 tanks in training units. Roughly one-third of them would be lost during the French campaign, which clearly shows that they had to face a capable enemy, although this enemy did not always use its own tank forces properly. In contrast, the French had 4,000 tanks, but they dispersed them among 11 divisions and several other units, and ended up losing 43% of them. Another difference was that the average Panzer division had around 300 tanks, while their French counterparts the Division Curassé and the Light Mechanized Divisions had 160 tanks on average. German tanks were oriented towards speed and movement, they all had a radio, while French tanks relied on firepower and armor 
with less cooperation between and within individual units. British tanks and tactics were inferior even to the French ones, thin armor and breakdowns were a major problem, while their heavier tanks, like the Matilda Mark II, were extremely slow. I hope you found this quick summary interesting. It is based on a great book, which I will include in the description below. Thank you for watching, see you next time!